Thank you for joining the Red Clinic Podcast. I'm Dr. Swalin, licensed psychologist and expert in the treatment of eating disorders. And today we're going to talk about autism and disordered eating, eating disorders. What's the connection? Is there a connection? What do parents and families and individuals out there struggling with both or one or the other uh, need to be thinking about? And so I have a very special guest, Nina Allen. Do you mind just telling the audience a little bit about yourself, your background, and then let's have a conversation. All right. Um, My name is Nina and I am a board certified behavior analyst and I'm also licensed behavior analyst in the state of Texas. Um, all right. So what, do, what are the kinds of clients that you usually work with? So usually, um, I work in home and also I offer center-based services. So families will come a lot of times and have concerns about food, um, nutrition, diet, and, um, that whole dynamic. And okay. so, um, a lot of times we're challenged with how do we support these families in home? Okay. So you're going into their homes. Sometimes you're in the center, but pretty much every client you're working with is on the autism spectrum. That's correct. Okay. So that's accurate. And then what age range do you usually work with? Um, I've worked with individuals as young as 18 months and all the way up until 30. All the way up until 30. Mm -hmm. So kids, adolescents, adults, you're seeing the whole um, age range across the spectrum of autism. Yes. All right. And so is it true that the picky eating or the food selectivity, is it just um, prevalent in children or are you also seeing that in adults? I'm seeing that in adults too. Okay. Um, as as people get older, their relationship with food really changes. Um, so um, I'm seeing that as different transitions happen. And so you're, you're not trained in working with eating disorders at all. And yet that phrase still came out of your mouth. And so that is really cool. So let's talk about that in terms of your understanding of like an individual's relationship with food. Why are you using that phrase with parents? Um, I grew up with food really important in my background and in my house. Um, I grew up where the, the kitchen was the hub Mm -hmm. and, um, the relationship with food. I, I say that a lot because if we're building this environment that we want to increase behaviors that, you know, um, we want to increase just the variety or quantity of food, or if we want to, um, develop that dynamic, that's a little better. Um, Yeah. And so so. you understand just from your own personal experience Mm -hmm. that our interaction with food is actually a relationship. There's like all these complicated factors, the memories we have from childhood, the messages we're getting about food from our society. There's so many things that go into just eating food. Yes. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, it's really exciting that you even have that awareness. That's really cool. Now, what I'm also hearing you talk about as a BCBA, someone who works with clients with autism the parents are bringing to you a concern for wanting to increase variety. So if they notice their child's a picky eater for whatever reason, um, they're concerned about it. And that honestly uh, is a little refreshing for me to hear because I actually used to, I actually used to go in and do in-home ABA when I was in grad school. Um, And so my experience with children on the spectrum and parents who were working with kiddos on the spectrum back then, because this was years and years ago, is that most parents, you know, are, are kind of desperate. They're very vulnerable. They want some kind of intervention for their child just to be able to communicate with their kid. Um, and so they'll try anything. And one of the things that was really big back in the, in my day, (laughs) I feel so old (laughs) y'all. And I said, y'all, oh my gosh, that's such a Texas (laughs) thing. Um, but one of the things that used to come up a lot was, playing around with the kid's diet, you know, gluten-free or uh, like something with the metals in their blood. Like I've heard some things that are really dangerous that some parents would try because someone somewhere said this may work, right? Um, And so, but what you're saying is instead of cutting things out of the diet, parents are now more focused, it sounds like, on wanting to actually increase the variety. That's correct. Um, when when I see parents that have challenges with food, they're they're um, they're in that desperation, you know, that desperation mindset where they are willing to try everything. Then pop culture tells us 
all sorts of things about our diet, right? And so that's reflective in our parenting and the environment that we have. What ch- what parents are modeling for kids, whether they're on the spectrum or not, is really important because kids are sponges. They they pick up on our habits and our ideas about food, right? And that is so true. I mean, we talk about that here on this show all the time is, you know, if you want to support your child in eating disorder recovery, you kind of need to be practicing what you're preaching in terms of being able to eat and, and come to the table and do some of these behaviors that we know support more variety in our, in our overall diet. Right. Right. And so when parents are coming to you and they're asking you questions about how do I increase my child's variety or how concerned should I be? How do you usually help them with that? I first want to make sure that I am, um, that we are looking at the whole scope of what it is. It's not just the behavior of the eating or that we need to increase variety. Is there anything medical that we need to rule out? Is there anything um, environmentally that we need to look at? And also we need to look inward in what the environment is in the home and is it conducive to what they're asking? Okay. Are you, as a parent, um, as a parent, am I asking my child to do something that I'm not willing to do, right? Um, And so a lot of times there is this treatment recommendation to, um, you know, it it can be really aversive. There can be a variety of factors that we need to look at. We need to look at sensory. We need to look at um, any allergies. There's lots of questions that come up. And so it sounds like like any good clinician, you go into scientist mode and you're like, where's the data? What other questions need to be answered here in order to guide these families in the right direction? Now, how often or how common is it for a child on the spectrum to actually also have an eating disorder? Like what are you seeing in, in your clinical work? It's, it's very common to have um, some sort of um, some sort of deficit or challenge around food. Okay. Whether it be social, um, communication, um, variety, rate, um, even environmental. There's, there's children that won't eat in certain environments um, because of sensory um, challenges. And so I think it's really important to look at everything in general. Um, Cause it's complicated. It right? is. It is so complicated. And especially when we have individuals that can't communicate, um, their wants and needs it's around nutrition. It's so important. Right. Um, they're looking to that parent or caregiver to really facilitate those needs. And, um, these, the relationship with food starts so young. Right. And so I, I really enjoy going in home and I really enjoy looking at this total scope. I actually ask parents to keep a food diary for themselves um, just so that they can see what it is that they are um, putting in their mouths in front of their kids, you know? And so um, mealtime is, it, it can be important if you're a parent coming to a clinician requesting something, um, then let's do the work about it. That's really cool. I actually really like that idea. So you're increasing parental awareness by having them keep the food diary. Like, let's not make this all about your kid all the time. Let's focus on us a little bit so we can even even determine if what we are expecting is realistic. Because mom and dad, if you're not willing to do it, we can't ask your child to do it. Right. Okay. And I will even ask them to put um, details on, um, sorry, but bowel movements. <laughs> so, because <laughs> that's okay. Our dietitians out. talk about poop all the time on this show. You're fine. You're in good company. <laughs> yep. Um, I've worked with the GIs and um, GI doctors and really had the ability to learn a lot. And um, so I'm thankful for professionals like you <laughs> that are willing to educate because um, it does. It takes, uh, it takes a lot of um, eyes on an issue if there is an issue and sometimes there isn't sometimes it can be just environmental or a, a slight change but sometimes there are things that can be sneaky that we need outside other professionals and and I think it's very important to collaborate okay yeah that multidisciplinary team approach is I mean it's a gold standard in eating disorder treatment so I can imagine it's a, it's just a gold standard when you're treating kids, right? I mean, right. we're working with the pediatric population specifically, right? For the most part, when we're talking about autism or even the work that I do with eating disorders and it takes a village. It really does. And we need team members on the treatment team also taking that approach. 
consulting one another and looking at all those complicated factors. And I may not have all the answers. I probably have some, but um, there are just so many great professionals, especially in this area that I can learn from. And at the end of the day, I'm there for the individual and their quality of life and um, just helping the family out. And that's so important when we talk about ABA because parent training, parent coaching, it we can do all sorts of things in center or in a therapy session in home or in, you know, the closed environment. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when we drop off the kid to the parent, it's, it's all hands on deck. And if they don't have the resources or the tools to generalize these skills in the home, it's, it's not going to stick. And so parent support is, so vital and to know that they're not alone and that they have um, so many people that can help them along the way. I love that. I mean, that's the same approach we want to take. It's always for advocating for the families, the parents, giving them support. That's why we do the work with that we do, right? right. So now one more question before we wrap it up. Um, if if there is a parent out there, a loved one of, 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 of a child or even an adult, right, wondering if they should be concerned about their person that has autism in terms of the amount of nutrition they're getting. What do you recommend they do? Who do they go to? Do they bring it up to someone like you? Will you guide them in the right direction? I mean, for those of those of our audience members listening, like how do we give them some action item or direction in this area? Um, I first will recommend for them to see their doctor first. Okay, um, medical rule out. Medical rule out because I, as much as I want to be, <laughs> I am not a doctor. And so um, that's something that we need to look at first. Uh, what is the actual challenge? What are they actually requesting? And we go from there. Um, we, we look at assessments in general. Um, there's a wide variety of assessments that are available that I can do, but initially it's, it's the medical. Okay. That we look at. Yeah. I love that yeah. approach. Mm -hmm. And so at the red clinic, we do the same thing. Um, especially when clients have avoidant restricted food intake disorder, which is also can be commonly associated with autism spectrum. Um, we ask parents to go and do the medical rule out. Um, I think it's so, so important for parents to kind of have that journey for themselves because if they have any inclination that there might be anything medical going on, it's very hard for them to then buy into the psychological part of it uh, because, you know, well, maybe it's not just anxiety around food or maybe it's not just something behaviorally that we can address. What if it's GI issues? And if the parent continues to ask that question and they never can really put that out of their head, we can't really get where we need to go next, right? So I, I love the let's rule out medical first. Um, and then, you know, just for you, those of you listening out there in the Red Clinic, we do have clients on the spectrum. We do treat them. We can address the family needs. We can address the parent training. We can do some um, nutrition with our registered dietitians. And then if ever needed, we're going to also rely on our uh, team out in the community, our counterparts who have the other subspecialty, right, of autism related things and work together as a team, hands down all the time. I um, My scope of practice is observable, measurable behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, I am not a professional in all the things that happen inside. And so I think that's important to keep in mind is that um, there are, there's a lot of things that we could look at. And it's not just ABA or environment or behavior. Right. We got to think so. of the person as a whole person. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I really me. appreciate it. And I hope that you come on again. <laughs> Thanks. It was a pleasure. Um, and there you have it. That's Red Clinic Podcast. Can't wait to see you again next week. <laughs>